summer warmth. We stand at the edge of summer. The sun has at last warmed us enough that we begin to trust in its presence. The last burst of spring blossoms, lavender and white and deep pink, banks of rhododendron, are giving way to summer peonies and roses. O oh, source of the turning seasons, of earth, of life, of promise gradually becoming fulfillment, may your people find a lightening of the burdens with the brightening of the sky. May it be so. Amen. There is a spiritual teacher named Brenda Salgado. She was trained by Toltec elders in traditional medicine and she draws on the healing powers of the natural world to guide her work as a spiritual leader. Salgado says, nature has taught me so much about moving with the seasons that we need to honor times of harvest and times of rest. That the frenetic pace of doing, doing, doing without being present with each other and the season we are in what is happening around us is unnatural and counter to life. So it has made me realize, she says, how important community ceremony and celebration is to our efforts to transform the world. It has made me realize how important community ceremony and celebration is to our efforts to transform the world. A hundred years ago in Czechoslovakia, Reverend Dr. Norbert Čapek was feeling that same need for community ceremony and celebration. Working with a diverse congregation, he felt the need for some symbolic ritual that would bind people more closely together. The format had to be one that would not alienate any who had forsaken other religious traditions. The traditional Christian communion service with bread and wine was unacceptable to the members of his congregation. So he turned to the native beauty of their countryside for elements of a communion which would be genuine to them. He introduced the idea of flower communion on June 4th, 1923. It was such a success that it was held every year after that, just before the summer recess of the church. The flower communion was brought to the United States and introduced to the members of our Cambridge, Massachusetts church by Chopek's wife, Maya. The Czech-born Maya had met Norbert in New York City while he was studying for his PhD. And it was at her urging that he left the Baptist ministry and turned to Unitarianism. The Chopics returned to Czechoslovakia in 1921 and established the dynamic liberal church in Prague. Maya Chopik was ordained in 1926. It was during her tour of the United States in 1940 that Maya introduced the flower communion here and it has been a tradition in our American Unitarian churches ever since. Unfortunately, Maya was unable to return to Prague due to the outbreak of World War II. And it was not until the war was over that Norbert Chopek's death in a Nazi concentration camp was revealed. When the Nazis took control of Prague in 1940, they found Dr. Chopek's gospel of the inherent worth and beauty of every human person to be, as Nazi court records show, too dangerous to the Reich for him to be allowed to live. Dr. Chopek was sent to Dachau, where he was killed the next year. This gentle man suffered a cruel death, but his message of human hope and decency lives on through his flower communion 
which is widely celebrated today. It is a noble and meaning-filled ritual that we are about to recreate. We love this ceremony for its simple beauty, but sometimes we forget how powerful the message really is. That showing up as our full selves, that celebrating difference rather than damning it, that joining together in ritual and celebration when others want us to live in shame and separation and fear is a revolutionary act, a ritual of beauty, but also an act of resistance and rebellion. So in that spirit, I invite you to bring your full, beautiful selves to the altar today with your flower and to create together a community bouquet symbolic of both our small community of love and rebellion and that of the Unitarian Church of Prague leading up to World War II. So I promise not to gush about my sabbatical every Sunday, <laughs> but maybe just a few more times. When I left for England at the beginning of May, spring had not yet arrived here on Cape Cod. You may remember its delayed arrival. It did not feel like April showers were going to bring any Mayflowers at all. And the trees were stubbornly bare on my drive to the airport. So when I landed in London and then took a train to the southwest coast, it was to a heavenly blanket of green. Green fields, green trees, green hedgerows. We don't really have hedgerows here, but they line every narrow English lane divide fields between farms and accompany you along every walking path. And they were all green and bursting with wildflowers. They were green but also pink and white and yellow and blue. The bluebells were the most stunning. There were bluebells everywhere in the English countryside and also wild garlic and marsh marigolds and wood sorrel and red campion and so many others. But the bluebells, they were my favorite. I had never seen them grow like that before. It was a gift of this unique trip, this magic land. I had these flowers specially shipped from England so you could admire <laughs> what I admired. <laughs> Just kidding. I picked this from my neighbor's yard yesterday. Don't worry, I asked her first. As it turns out, bluebells grow right here at home. They are not mystical and magical English-only flowers, <laughs> although they are mystical and magical in the way that all flowers are, if we remember to notice them, to stop and be in awe of them. I guess at home I forget to be in awe sometimes. Being in a new landscape reminded me in the color purple, Alice Walker's character, Shug, says, I think it pisses God off if you walk by the color purple in a field somewhere and don't notice it. <laughs> in England, I noticed everything, and it was astonishing. Earlier in my sabbatical in March, Lisa and I traveled to the West Coast we had a road trip from Los Angeles to San Francisco, driving along the beautiful coast and stopping along the way to see friends and family. 
Lisa's sister lives just north of LA and we spent some time hiking in the beautiful hills. Normally these hills are dry and brown, but after months of unusually rainy weather, they too were green and alive, beautiful. But if you looked closely, you saw that all that lush growth was new, and that underneath the green, the earth was charred black by fire. All the trees were gone save for the blackened skeletons of the strongest trunks. Lisa's sister lives in an area that was evacuated during those awful fires last fall. Now, months later, it was a devastating and hopeful landscape all at the same time. One Saturday morning, I went with Lisa's brother-in-law on a longer hike through taller, less populated terrain that had also been decimated by fire. Here, the charred hills were not only green, but also blooming. I was astonished to see my favorite flower, lupin, everywhere. Brenda, Miss Rumphius, lupin lady, I thought of you. The hills were also covered with a bright, cheerful yellow that I recognized from my time studying in England in college. Mustard. It covered everything, huge swaths of it. Forest fires are devastating at first, but for the most part, nature has its systems for resilience. Vegetation will return in its own due course. In some cases, plants sprout that have not been noticed in years, triggered only after the heat of flames. Others take advantage of the open ground and fly in with fresh seeds. Silvery lupin, lupinus argentius seeds, are scarified by the heat, enabling buried seeds to germinate quickly. Mustard plants lay down thousands of seeds and are one of the first plants to spring up after a fire. So that's why the charred landscape was hopeful. It was blooming. I'd like to leave it there. I really would. But I've gotten in trouble with the botanists in the congregation before. So... I don't want to misrepresent nature when I can help it. Flowers are a hopeful sign, but they are not always exclusively a healthy sign. You see, lupin growing after a fire really is pretty cool, even to the botanists. But mustard plants, fields of yellow flowers growing in California, that is not such a good thing. You see, those yellow flowers, Brassica nigra, black mustard, is not native to California. It was brought by Spanish colonizers, intended to be a spice crop, but it quickly spread, and it's invasive. It germinates before native plants have taken hold, shoots up more than six feet tall, hogs the sunlight with its thick stalks, and lays down a deep system of roots that beats out native plants for water. They tend to dry up by July or August, and along with invasive European grasses, they serve as kindling during Southern California's long wildfire season. Mustard can make matters worse during a fire because the stalks are taller than the grasses and can act as a fire ladder, carrying flames to taller trees. I'm sorry about this. <laughs> I really like mustard fields. <laughs> but I want to be honest with you. And really, as long as we're learning from nature, the truth is, we are like the charred land after fire passes. We are resilient. There are seeds in us that only come alive after we have been through hard things. 
After hard things, we find a power and a life force that we didn't even know we contained. Our inner landscapes will not be barren for long. We too will bloom. Some of the ways we find to survive are beautiful and a gift to the world, like the lupin. And some of the ways we find to survive are powerful, but not in the end what we or the world needs, like the mustard. After loss and disappointment, it is up to us. Reverend Dr. Norbert Chopek wrote this consecration of the flowers. Infinite spirit of life, we ask thy blessing on these, thy messengers of fellowship and love. May they remind us amid diversities of knowledge and of gifts to be one in desire and affection and devotion to thy holy will. May they also remind us of the value of comradeship, of doing and sharing alike. May we cherish friendship as one of thy most precious gifts. May we not let awareness of another's talents discourage us or sully our relationship, but may we realize that whatever we can do, great or small, the efforts of all of us are needed to do thy work in this world. Amen. Look around. Do not be shy about blossoming. It is our nature. When others see us, it can inspire them to open up and blossom too. And we can be a field ablaze with dignity and beauty together. Go in peace.